quickly go over the room and then just do a, a, a short self-introduction and then talking about how you think uh, your research might uh, incorporate uh, uh, biometric research and uh, how those particular research might benefit you or what your area of interest might be. So uh, maybe we start with uh, Tara and then we go over through the room. Yeah. Great. Um, can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, I'm Tara Mortensen and I'm a visual communication researcher. Um, and a lot of my research has to do with um, like professional staff uh, photojournalism and how people perceive that differently from things like uh, wire photos or stock photos or citizen shot photography. Perfect, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Hannah, you want to go second? Huh? Oh, what? Oh, we're talking about like maybe some of your research interests and then how do you think like biometric research might, might help you? Okay. Yeah. Um, so where's the camera here? And no, uh, we were, talking. yeah, just talking, yeah. Okay, um, um, I'm the first year PhD student. Um, uh, this is my first time to participate in such like meetings. Um, I'm interested in the uh, experiment uh, method of research. So, yeah, I'm interested in and uh, I want to like share, you, uh, share ideas with, with, you, with you guys. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, my name is Nick Bear. I'm a second year PhD student in the School of Library and Information Science, and I'm here today to. Um, so, I'm working with Dr. June and Dr. Kiefner on their e cigarettes uh, oh. program, I guess. I and so, we're going to be using the software to understand oh, different okay. messages and how students perceive uh, vaping and e cigarettes and how they use that to engage behaviors. Hello, uh, I'm Jun Kim, uh, a uh, 50 year doctoral candidate, and I'm also working for Dr. Jun. Oh, and we are planning to um, use an eye tracking system mm -hmm. to uh, investigate, investigate how people react to uh, e cigarette warning labels yeah. and e cigarette and other tobacco products mm -hmm. as well. So, like, um, maybe perhaps including emotional and physiological uh, response to warning labels. Perfect. Oh, hi. Oh, sorry, I'm late. So we're just oh yeah, we're just introducing ourselves and then talking about like uh, maybe your research interest. How does that relate to biometric? Or how you're thinking about using biometric in the future? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, again, have Doctor Wu go first, and then we'll come back to you. Yeah, take some breath. <laughs> oh, it's fine. Sure. Do you want? Yeah, I should go. Yes. Yes. Very great. Um, uh, hello again, no, no. Um, I'm a first year doctoral student um, and my research interest um, is health communication and strategic communication. Um, I also I'm also doing some like PR um, uh, related research. Um, I'm here because I really into the eye tracking mm -hmm. um, technology so I I didn't have like uh, any like prior background, so I think today is uh, like an introduction for the eye tracking. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Hi, Rob. Robert, this is Ling Wang. I'm uh, in the same department as Taylor, so advertising that definitely one of my from primary area. And I just get tired of doing like the self-reported data, you know, with the consumers. <laughs> so I want to see how eye tracking and other like like biometrics, like you know, skin conduction, facial expression, and EEG, may, maybe how it works. I know you are not going to cover all of them today, but uh, I will definitely have the opportunity to you know to talk more about that. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Right, great. Um, um, I would I would also do a brief introduction as well. So uh, for those who you don't know me, that uh, so I'm Taylor Wen. Uh, I am, uh, it's my third, year. my third year, come on. So my third year as assistant professor uh, in a journalism school. Uh, so before coming to South Carolina, I did my PhD in Florida. So where I get uh, a chance to learn a lot of things related to emotions and I used uh, most of their uh, softwares back in Florida. Uh, the only thing I didn't use is the EEG, so which I'm very excited to learn that later in early November, the Boston training. Um, so uh, that is why it gets me uh, started to uh, do 
doing more research and then looking uh, at research from a different landscape, uh, such as the biometric and psychophysiology area. So, um, so um, I also wanna extend a warm welcome to all of you uh, coming here, and I wanna give a special thanks to Robert for spending your time uh, with us and talking about eye motions. So, I think we are good to get started. Perfect, thank you guys for the introduction. Um, uh, let me introduce myself real quick um, and let you know a little bit about um, my emotions and what we'll be planning to do uh, right now. So it might be a little bit better if I can turn my screen on so I can uh, see you guys as well. Hold on here. All right. Are you guys on a projector? Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. Perfect. So, hello, my name is Robert Christopherson. I work with iMotions. Um, I've been with iMotions for about five years. And I moved from um, uh, my PhD program in, into working with iMotions. My background is in um, education, technology, and communication. So I was looking in the learning field and really trying to understand how does boredom and frustration manifest physiologically, and how can you understand that and adapt systems to um, help mitigate some of the boredom and frustration before you disengage in a, in a system. So I've been working for about a while trying to build my own system and then I came across iMotions and figured um, I don't want to spend time, I'm not a computer scientist, so using a tool like iMotions really helped expedite the research I was doing and uh, at the institution that we were at as well. And so I'm excited that uh, Taylor's been doing the same thing here with you guys and is going to helpfully move some of this stuff forward so you don't have to spend a lot of time working on the back end and you can focus a lot more on the research. Now, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to record this session so that if you need to come back, you can do it. So we're going to be moving kind of fast. And um, we'll be just covering some of the basics. So I'm just going to go ahead and start that recording. This conference will now be recorded. So anybody who's in here is at the end of the session, if you want to either give Taylor your information or send me my send me your information. I can make sure I get these links and any documentations that we talk about to you guys. Um, so as of right now, you guys are about ready to get a larger lab. So you're going to have a lot of different stations. Um, you're going to have a lot of different um, components and hardware to use. But we're just going to go over the basics right now. So this is more of just a high level overview of how to use the iMotions tools. And we're going to focus just today on a little bit about how to connect the sensors, um, how to set them up um, to the computer and then into iMotions. We'll also talk a little bit about, oh, we'll, then we'll talk about how to build the study um, to bring in the different stimuli and use our, our study presentation tool. And hopefully we'll wrap up by showing you how to collect a little bit of data. And then what we'll do is we'll kind of turn you guys loose and at least Taylor and some other people will take some time to collect some data. Then they'll share that with me and then our next session We'll have is we'll go over data analysis, data visualization, AOIs, exporting the data, getting it to the point where you can use it in Excel or bring it into SPSS. Now, iMotions itself doesn't do any statistical analysis, but hopefully by the time we're done, we can share with you how you might go about uh, prepping the data so that you can then run your ANOVAs, t-test, regression, whatever you want to do, uh, couple it with your qualitative and quantitative data, and draw your, your own professional conclusions. So that's really the goal of iMotion. We don't claim to be experts in, in everything, but we have a lot of expertise within our skill set. And I'll be kind of your point person uh, for this institution and this installation. So if you do need some training or can't find a certain document, uh, we can help you with that. Now, I know Taylor and a couple other people are coming out to do what we call our in-house academy. And um, basically, it's a 40 hours almost crash course on how to use iMotion. There's going to be more in-depth lectures on what is eye tracking, what's it used for, what do those biometrics mean. We're not going to cover a lot of the meaning in these in these sessions. A lot of these sessions is just how to use the tool. Um, we do have other opportunities like an, an online academy um, if you want to do that or uh, maybe we can work with Taylor, I don't know, is setting up a workshop locally to go over some in-depth stuff as things progress. So those are some of your options. I just want to lay those out first um, and then we'll jump into this. Um, before any then, before we jump into this, any questions from your end? No, I think we're ready. We're good to go. Okay. We're going to introduce what you have right now here. Um, I think um, Robert's going to talk about the device. Yeah, yeah. I think we're good yeah. to go. Yes. 
Okay, so the first thing you want to do is connect your sensors to your computer. So Taylor, there today, do you have your shimmer device with you? No, we don't have the shimmer for this one. We only have the facial okay. expression and the eye tracking for today, yeah. Okay, well let's start out with the eye tracking. So is the eye tracking connected to the computer you're looking at right now? Yes, so this is the eye, so let me show everyone. So this is the eye tracker. So uh, the one that we have is the Toby X230. Uh, and this is how we connect it with the USB. And uh, we have already like a tab attached to that. So it's a magnet. So it would just automatically uh, attach to it. And then uh, we already set up uh, it to connect with the eye motions already. Yeah. Perfect. And so this eye tracker can go at the bottom of a laptop. Um, maybe when you get a lab, you'll put it at the bottom of another external monitor, and that might get a lot easier. So iMotions, um, first of all, has to connect the hardware to the computer, um, and it looks like you've, you've probably done a little bit about that. Yes. But now let's set it up so it connects to iMotion. So you're going to go up to Preferences and Local Settings. Yeah, um, so I already done that, but I'm we will show everyone. Yes. So we go to Preferences okay. and Global Settings. Yep, and then inside here, now hopefully you won't have to be changing this too much. Basically, you turn on the eye tracker, select the eye tracker, um, the model that you have, and this is the Toby X230. And there's going to be a whole bunch of different models you guys could possibly have, but I think right now um, the X230 is the ones you'll have in your lab. And then just go ahead and click on the test connection. All right, and that says that it's good to go, we're connecting. So we're just gonna close this setup for now and we'll come back and talk a little bit about this. But go ahead and click okay. All right, and if you can double click on what we call our eye tracking widget, go ahead and double click on that. Yep, and you can make that bigger by dragging one of those corners and making it larger so everybody can see. There you go. So, um, if, if Taylor, if you look for it, these are basically your eyes, and you can see here. So, a couple of information is on the top left, you see the sampling rate. Um, this eye tracker samples about 30 hertz, so you're always going to have that number right around that 30 hertz. On the right is the distance to the screen in centimeters, and then we kind of call this our, our, not our dummy proof, but we try to keep this methodology of red light, green light, meaning if it's green, you're going to collect some data. If it's red, then you're not going to get it in. If it's yellow, it's somewhere in between. So you can tell that if the person's sitting in the right place, this should work um, accordingly. Now, typically, I'll just go over a few things about setting up people with the eye tracker. Um, these are your eyes of where you are. And so trying to set up the respondent to get good data, the first thing you're going to want to do is you're going to want to try to center those eyes in the center of that area. So that might mean, Taylor, you're going to have to pivot the screen towards you a little bit. So if your laptop and screen, you can maybe pull it in towards you a little bit. And you want the person to be comfortable. So asking the person to move um, is going to make them kind of feel artificially in an awkward position. So typically, you're going to want a system that you move the computer and not the person. And tell the person to relax. Because over time with the study, somebody might relax and they're going to drift down lower and lower. And you don't want to lose their eyes in a study that takes you know, 20 or 30 minutes. So just a rule of thumb, you're going to want those eyes to be about center in this graph, maybe a little bit higher than center, so in case they start slouching, it, it will happen that way. Um, also, just a note from an eye tracking standpoint, this eye tracker works great for about 95 to 98% of your population. Um, you're going to have problems if somebody has uh, astigmatism, uh, because basically that's the, the lens of their eye has um, different shapes, and that, this is a pupil-based one where it uses light to reflect. To understand what's going on in the eyes. So if they have astigmatism, you probably can't run them in their study. This is a, also a, a um, binocular um, eye tracking system. So if they do have an issue with uh, an extreme lazy eye, glass eye, or something like that, this won't work. Glasses will work. The only ones that don't work are bifocals, where um, they're basically it's two different lenses together um, because that's going to change the shape of the pupil if they look down and look up. Uh, glasses should work, generally speaking, unless they have very thick um, rims. The lenses, doesn't matter if it's thick, but if the lens is really thick, it actually start blocking the light from going into their eyes. So um, the way this works is it shows infrared light from the eye tracker into the eyes, and then it uses um, a calculation to pick up the glint of the, the pupil, and it determines the, the shape of the pupil, and then it can map it to the computer. So just really high level, um, you do kind of have to keep in mind um, about 
glasses sometimes or really thick rims. Uh, astigmatisms are the two biggest things that will stop um, the eye tracker from working. But other than that, um, it should work for most of whatever you're doing. So if you are running an eye tracking study and you've done your statistical power and your study says you need about 20 people, um, I always recommend to oversample by about 10% just in case. All right, any questions about the eye tracker, what it is, or how to set the person up for it? Uh, so, the person, like the participant, should look at, at the screen or look at, at the, the bar? They need to look at the screen, the center of the screen. They should be paying attention to the bar. Okay. Um, and so you can use the guides here. Typically, the person won't see what's happening here. We recommend doing a dual screen setup. So they'll be sitting on a screen, they won't see anything except for the background. You as the operator will be sitting at the laptop or another computer, and you'll be able to kind of guide them to how this room sits. Thanks. Perfect. All right, so let's go ahead and um, close this out. All right, now that that's connected to iMotions, the next thing is the facial expression tool. So if we go up to Preferences Global Settings, Now, I think, Taylor, you asked about a USB camera versus the built-in one, right? Yeah, but now we're using a USB camera. Okay, perfect. So if you go click on the video tab, in here you have the responding camera. Now, the nice thing, because you have a, a separate camera, you don't have to move the computer monitor, because you just move the computer monitor to set up for eye tracking. Now you can pivot the camera separately and try to get the face kind of in the center. So you might want to move it down just a little bit, or move it up a little bit so your face is a little more centered. There you go. Okay, this Perfect. Oh, okay. There you go. So you want to do that center, kind of same rules apply. Um, a couple things for the facial expression to work optimally. It needs to see both of the eyebrows, um, the corners of the eyes, and the nose and the face. So if you do have long hair, you can ask somebody to pull it back. Maybe they can put it back in a ponytail um, if they have long hair. If they have um, excessive facial hair or long beard, sometimes they're in style right now, um, if they can't see the corner of the mouth and the bottom of the chin, facial expression won't work that well. So just keep that in mind as you're screening people to bring them in. If facial expression analysis is critical to your study, you're gonna to wanna to make sure you have some of those things, um, that you screen for some of those things. Also, during the study, if somebody's touching their face excessively, chewing gum, you're gonna get artifacts in your data because it's gonna pick up on movement that isn't related to their specific emotions. So just keeping that in mind. Um, another thing from a, a, um, a setup standpoint, uh, Taylor, you do a good job with this right now, is behind you, there's not people walking behind you, there's not an excessive bright light or anything like that. So you wanna keep the person kind of equally lit and that you can see their face pretty clearly. So try to minimize distractions. Um, that also helps with eye tracking and other behavior. If you're in a position where a lot of people are walking around or there's a lot of noise, they're going to be looking off and you're going to lose a little bit of data. So just general rule of thumb, minimize distractions. Don't have a window or a door right behind the person necessarily in the camera view. Um, and that will help them um, attend to what they need to and you're not going to have any um, artifacts from other people coming in. Uh, the other thing we sometimes we do recommend doing is a second USB camera and we can plug that into the environment camera. And just having this on the profile, and especially when you're using GSR or EEG, um, some people might touch or fidget or move around. If I'm just looking at your face, I don't know what you're doing with your hands. And so sometimes we recommend doing just a, another camera. If they're in a cubicle, you can set that off to the side and have them just look down there or on the desk looking at their hands. It just gives you a little bit more information to understand if there's any artifacts or noise in your signals. And so that's usually helpful. And you can set that up here, just click on that environment camera option there. Right now you don't have a second camera, so we're not gonna set it up, but that's where you would set it up. Um, other than that, uh, this looks pretty good. Uh, typically, um, you don't need high definition video. Uh, 640 by 480 is recommended, it works great. And we'll dive into kind of why that is here in just a second. The last thing I wanna point out is click on the option button next to it. Um, in here is the camera settings. If the person's moving around a lot or touching their face, you might want to adjust some of these, specifically remove the autofocus. So uncheck that so it's not changing midstream. Um, you don't want it to change focus because the person accidentally puts their hand up in front of the camera or they move in or move out. 
um, that will trigger that autofocus. So other than that, you can go ahead and click save here now. All right, let's go ahead and click OK. All right, can you double click on your face camera now? And let's make that full screen for just a second. All right, so a couple of things we want to point out. We'll start in the top left. Um, top left is telling you how many um, frames, of the, that's the 30, you should always have around 30 because it's a USB camera. The other number is how many frames in real time iMotions is analyzing. Um, so we don't bog down your system, we try to cap that about 50%. So that should always be around 15 frames. If it drops lower than that, it probably means your computer is bogged down and you can completely turn off the facial expression analysis in real time and run it all post. But for now, we're going to keep it in, in real time. The other thing you can see in the center is the camera also is connected to a mic. So if you do want to hear about talking or something like that, you have that option. And it gives you some feedback about what camera is picking up what mic. Um, the other thing to the right there, you notice, is the pixels. And now that's the square of the face. So that's, that's pixels squared with regards to the rectangle around Taylor's face. And that's always going to be, um, typically with distance, what we're seeing here, if they're about that 60 centimeters away, it's going to be about 150. They can go down to as low as 100 and still find a face, but you don't want to have it smaller than that or else it'll be a hard time finding that face. So if you have to do um, a study where the camera needs to be further away, that's the only time you might want to bump it up and make a high definition so you have more pixels to find a 100 square um, a box rectangle of the person's face. Now iMotions right now um, in real time is only set up to look at one person's face at a time. You can, and let's say if you have two people doing a scenario, like we have a lot of communications, people looking at um, how do they attend watching a commercial or playing a game together simultaneously. So with this tool here, you can have a camera away from them, you can re record two people's face, and then in post process, you can say look for person one, and then look for person two separately and bring them in as two separate respondents. If you're interested in some of those kind of um, non-traditional setups, please feel free to reach out to me, I can help you set some of those up. Uh, the other thing to note right here is again all those dots are picking up on landmarks on the face and those are critical for understanding what do these mean. So once again, um, the hair, the corner of the eye, we want to make sure that we can see um, the full shape of the eyes and the full shape of the eyebrows and that will help um, to get that. Now if you start talking and stuff like that or open your mouth, it does understand that. So facial expressions is not optimized for um, uh, picking up on expressions while people are talking. So if that facial expression was looking at my face right now, you'd get a lot of artifacts from my nose down. You wouldn't have a lot of those um, emotions that we'd be looking at. Um, yeah, I think that covers about everything here. Any questions about the setup or what this is looking at for the face or how to collect some or how to set up the respondent? All right, we can go ahead and minimize that or close that out. Okay, if there are any questions, feel free to, to stop me. So now we've connected to the computer. Um, just go ahead and click OK for now. Um, go ahead and press cancel first. All right, so now we're gonna set up uh, your, your first study. So step number one, make sure the sensors are coming to the computer. Step number two, set up your study. So on the left, you're gonna click on the library, the plus button next to the library. And in here, you're going to set up a few things. Um, this is your study name. So for now, we can just call this uh, test one. You make sure your studies have unique names. Um, the other thing to talk about is the resolution screen. This is very critical when you're sharing studies or moving from one screen to the other. We typically recommend that your screen be set at 1920 by 1080. Um, that's the optimal resolution. So let's see if we can try to get your computer to look at that right now. So if you can go back to your desktop and right click and on your desktop and we're going to look at displays. And let's go ahead and scroll down and see if we can set it to 1920 by 1080. All right, so right now it's saying the, re the resolution is really high resolution. So we're going to set that down to 1920 by 1080. If that gives you, go ahead and click on that one, yep. All right, and then the next thing we want to do is where it says recommend it at 125%. This is basically taking your pixels and zooming in a little bit. 
we typically recommend to set that at 100%. All right, now I don't think we'll need to restart your computer or log out and log back in, but this is what we recommend if you're running an iMotion study to have it set up at these. If you have a second monitor, make sure they're set up at 1920 by 1080. And then you can go ahead and close this out now. All right, it is a little bit smaller. You can make um, iMotion's full screen if you want. All right, now that we have that set up, the other thing that we want to do is now, um, we set up your computer to be 1920 by 1080. Now we're gonna tell the study what resolution it should display everything at. So now you're gonna set this to 1920 by 1080. So you can just scroll over to the right until it gets to 1920 by 1080. There are some cases where you have to change this to be a different resolution if you're doing um, I, eye tracking on, let's say, an iPad or an iPhone or something like that. Um, you can set this to a custom resolution and we can talk about that. Um, the other thing that we recommend doing, we're not going to have to do that today, but I do recommend that you set the physical display. So the resolution is the digital display, right? That's what's on your laptop, your, your screen resolution. The physical display is the actual physical size of your um, monitor. So right now, when you're on a laptop, I can pretty much guarantee that you're not working at a 27 inch. Um, most likely it's a 19 inch. So if you can go ahead and change that to 19 inch. So there are a few 19 inches. Uh, what is the ratio that I should select? It's probably going to be 16 by 9. It looks like it's a little more rectangle. Yeah. Go ahead and click on that. Now, I would recommend that you do a physical measuring, get out a, a measuring tape and measure the actual uh, screen, the visible screen. Don't measure the bevel or anything like that, but the screen and put those measurements in there. Also, with the distance, as we saw with the eye tracker, you're sitting about 65 centimeters away. So you can go ahead and change that to about 65. This is going to help your eye tracking. If you don't do it and you forget to do it, you're going to have pretty good data. But this is going to take it to the next level. This is going to make it so you can get a lot more accurate than you would if you just didn't change any of the settings. And this is set at the study level. So you can't run the study. Every time you run the study, it's going to check your computer and say, is it 1920 by 1080? If not, it's going to give you a warning. All right, so now we've set that up. For now, we're not going to change anything else. Go ahead and click Next. Okay, as you can see here, um, when it will go ahead and identify what is going on on your system. So it can say you have your computer set up for the eye tracking, um, the X230. It also is going to go ahead and show you that the respondent camera set up and that you are going to use Aftex. If you have the environment camera or something else turned on, um, those options would be available. Also, once you get your shimmer center, sensor, and it sounds like somebody's from the EEG, um, those would be enabled here as well. So for now, um, the only thing I'm going to have you turn on is actually the external event API um, here. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. Hopefully, if we have time about with regards to running a Qualtrics survey. So I know some of you guys are using Qualtrics surveys, and we can talk a little bit about that um, later on in the session. All right, now we have the study set up. Go ahead and click Add. And now you have a study. And you can come back and change any of these things if you ever want to um, by just um, changing the information in here and clicking Update. And you can also change the sensors. At the top, you see some tabs where it says Sensor Information. Go ahead and click on that. Um, if any of you guys have run eye tracking studies before, click on the Gaze Analysis uh, tab that makes one over. Uh, this is using what filters we use in iMotion, so you have a couple different options here. This IVT is kind of the, the uh, standard for the industry. Um, if you want to change it, you can here. There are some parameters. But basically with eye tracking, and this is at a high level, we're not going to dive too much in this, but when you're looking at eye tracking data, your eyes are always moving. They're looking all over the screen. And those are every single movement of your eyes is called a gaze point means those are both conscious and non-conscious movements. And then when you try to fixate it, so if I ask Taylor to look at the record button, she's probably fixating on the record button, and that would be a fixation. Uh, we'll show this a little bit later what those look like. But just to note, um, this is gaze analysis, is to help how do you calculate what is a fixation? How do you understand what is a cognitive or a directional um, attention of somebody's gaze points into a specific area? 
Um, so you'll dive that into a little bit later. And we have some other documentations and um, uh, a little um, booklet we've written to help explain some of that. Uh, the rest of the information for now, we're not going to dive into, uh, but I just wanted to show you these three settings here up front. All right, so we've breezed through this, we've set up the computer, and we've also set up the sensors for a study. The last thing I just want to show you a little bit of information is there is kind of a real-time preview of what this table looks like. So, if Taylor, can you click on that graph there on the left? Okay. All right, so what we're getting at the top is the eye tracking data with regards to what's coming out of the eye tracker. So this is going to give you pupil dilation. Now, just a, a caveat when you're looking at pupil dilation, um, I, I would recommend not putting a lot of stock into this because the sampling rate is at 30 hertz. The pupil dilate dilates a little bit faster than that. So if you're really interested in pupil dilation, we probably recommend upgrading your hardware to something that's 60 hertz, 120 hertz, or, or faster. So some research labs will have multiple eye trackers depending on what they're wanting to do. Um, distance to the screen is a good one also. If you slightly lean in, Taylor, or move back, you'll see that distance metric change with regards to that, and that's picking up on that distance to the screen. Now, generally speaking, um, in academia, or when I'm looking at education technology or educational researchers, we find interest and boredom related to that distance to the screen, whereas people are more interested, they might move in. If they're less interested, sometimes or they're bored, they'll move away. So that might be a metric you might be interested in looking at as well. Uh, the other thing you notice here is you do get some blinks happening, um, where you have those spikes in that data, and so you can use this as a tool to understand blink rate. Um, some of those, some of you might look in the literature where blink rate, the how frequent they are, also relates to cognitive processing, emotional state. So you might use that as a frequency metric to look at maybe blink rate. Um, over on the left, uh, Taylor, there's the word eye tracker, and then there's a little pencil and a little arrow. Put on the arrow for me. Let's jump. Yeah, let me walk through this graph here real quick. Um, you have this for all the graphs. Um, basically, you can turn on, turn off auto scaling, what's happening right now. You can change it from a, a field line to um, an empty line. Um, so, in this one, go ahead and uncheck the thing that says use field lines. And typically, we recommend um, leaving auto scaling on unless you're, you, have, you know the range. So, until you are understanding, familiar with the range, we leave that on. And go ahead and click save. So now you get kind of a graph and you like that. So you can change these however you want to look at them. All right, the next one down is, um, let's minimize this. So over up at the top where it says the eye tracker, click on the arrow now. All right, so this next group, um, we're going to actually minimize this one. We'll come back to the emotion ones first. So go ahead and close that one. Uh, close this next one. And let's look at this behavioral one first. So this is basically the orientation of your head. So if you turn your head or rotate it, move it forward, move it backwards, um, you're going to see fluctuations here in that graph. Um, this is for, typically you're looking at very subtle movements. So if you see somebody who might be confused or they'll slightly turn their head one way or the other way, it's going to give you orientation of that. So if that's of interest to you, you can look at that information. Uh, one thing to note here, it looks like every other sample is missing. That's because we're only doing 15 frames per second in real time. And we can go back and, and analyze all the other missing frames in this. So this is what we call... Um, the um, behavioral information, the one at the bottom, the interocular distance, it's also kind of a, um, a backup for distance with the eye tracking. So this is also telling you how close you are to the screen or how you move away from the screen. So this is giving you information about the distance between your pupil. So as you move closer to the camera, you get bigger. As you move further away, that number gets small. All right, so let's go ahead and minimize this one. Let's look at the other one. Turn on facial expressions. All right, so facial expressions is talking about um, the, the groups of muscles and as they move together. So the very first one at the top, I believe, is brow furrow. Can you go ahead and furrow your brow, Taylor? We get a little spike happening there with furrowing the brow. Um, we can also do brows raise. Um, I think that's uh, cheek raise, like when you smile, or when you raise your chin. So this is talking about those individual um, muscle groups and how they move down. Um, a lot of people look at brow furrow as a metric of sometimes uh, frustration um, as they're kind of forming the brow or concentration. So depending on what you're looking at, a little bit more. 
Um, generally speaking, um, with my audio, are you guys hearing me okay? Is it coming in and out? Yeah, we can't hear. Yeah. Okay. Let me just double check here on my internet connection. So I don't need it as long. Okay. Um, but these are just the information about those muscle movements. The only one I want to point out at the top, if you go all the way to the top of this group, is this one what they call attention. Um, that's typically what a lot of researchers like attention, but just to let you know, this is just, is their face facing the camera? So if you look away from the camera, that attention will drop down. So go ahead and move your head, Taylor, look away from the camera. And then look back. And that's basically that attention method. So if you see that, that's what it's meaning with regards to attention. All right, um, let's look at the other, last one here. Um, go ahead and minimize the facial expression one. And let's do emotion. So these are taking all of those landmarks, all those muscle movements, and categorizing them as if a real human coder would. And so they're, basically this is a, a value from zero to 100. And, and that's basically saying, would a human coder recognize that as that being expressed. So the higher the number, the more confident the algorithm is that that face is expressing anger. So we're gonna ask you, Taylor, to, to see if we can have you hit a few of these. So can you give us your best angry face? Furrowing your brow. It's not angry. Oh, I, I, I have to do it this teaching schedule. <laughs> All right, we got, we got a little bit of anger there. Now that's kind of a hard one. Uh, contempt is basically an asymmetrical movement of the face. So just like a sideways smile. All right, that's a little harder to detect on there. Um, maybe you can try um, your disgust one. So that's wrinkling of the nose and puckering the lips a little bit. All right, let's try. Definitely the joy is picking up. We got a very positive face there, so that's where the joy methods are coming in there. All right, let's go and scroll down a little bit more. Now, I, I don't know if too many of you have worked with um, real-time measurements of emotion, but basically some research um, kind of camps or really look at this is they look at um, a lot of these facial expressions, these align to a, a continuum of emotions along the valence method. So valence is basically, is it a positive or negative emotion? And then inside of that, though, that kind of continuum or that circumflex of emotion, you have um, what we call discrete or categorical emotions. And that's like the bucket of joy or fear or disgust. Now, I do want to point out that this is um, strictly a manifestation of these emotions. It does not mean that the person is feeling these emotions. So it would be very clear when you're writing up any papers that you don't say, this person felt fear 50% of the time. They manifest fear, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they felt it. Um, typically, also, if you're just starting out, we, we probably recommend that unless you have a good rationale, don't start out with the categorical emotions because sometimes they're hard to defend or you might have a theoretical construct of disgust, which is an internal construct, but might not align to what's being manifest on the face. So just keep that in mind. It's easier to start if you scroll down. So just look at the face as a tool to say, are they expressing a positive or negative emotion? So Taylor, if you could scroll down a little bit. In here, we're looking at engagement. So engagement is the overall emotion being expressed. So that could be positive or negative, and that's why you're going to get those spikes in the graph. The one underneath that is valence. So positive, valence, this is the only one that goes from negative 100 to 100, and that's going to give you anything that's positive is going to be positive, or anything negative is going to be negative. So even though you might not be able to manifest disgust, but if you, if you do furrow your brow or um, frown, you're going to get some negative emotions. So now we get some negative valence going on right there. Uh, and that's typically what we recommend people to start out with, is looking at the valence and the engagement methods. All right, so we've breezed through a lot of these really quickly. Are there any questions about this or what we're seeing? Do you have a list of the definition of all those different things? I'm sorry, you've got to talk a little bit about it. Okay, 
but I, um, because there are a lot of different um, metrics here, do you have a, like a list of definition or explanation that we can go to check when we look up if we need something like yep. the, I'll make the, I'll make note of that, but yeah, we, on our help center, um, that's where if you do send your email, I can give you access to. Okay, cool. So these and our, our blog actually has a lot of information about this as well. So um, there's three areas. We have our help center, um, our blog, and we call them our pocket guides that talk about all these information which go on. Do these ever change? Um, for instance, I'm studying trust versus skepticism, and I don't see those constructs. So would these ever change? So these are typically the constructs that are coming out of the research of Paul Ekman. We did a lot of stuff with the initial um, human coders of facial expressions. Um, the reason why these categorical ones probably won't ever change is that it's kind of based off of the tool that we're, we're building on top of. However, um, a lot of people, like the ones where I'm looking at uh, boredom and frustration, they don't show up here. So in lieu of that, um, I look at the literature and I find out what are those, what they call action units or facial movements that happen. And I can look at those and I can just recalculate those myself um, after the fact. And that's where everything's based off of those action units. So that would be that other group where we look at the brow furrow. Um, so if you do find literature where it does define something like trust, if there's a, a facial expression that does that, they're going to most likely be using some of these action units to calculate that. Thank you. Well, that's a good question. Any other questions? No, I think we're good. Okay. All right, so this is just about putting the centers, giving you a little idea of what these biometrics are coming in. And um, let's go ahead and close this out. So the window over the top right, you can close that. There you go. All right, so now we're finally ready to start building our study. So I definitely recommend before you build a study, you kind of keep in mind of what is the order? What is the sequence you want people to, to see? And also when you're doing research, um, trying to understand how do we uh, compensate for whether it's an order effect or something like that, you probably want to randomize. So having in mind whether you stencil it out and, and on hand or that is going to help you come in and build that because up here at the top is kind of a linear progression of what people will experience when we can set things to be randomized or in different blocks. So the first thing we're going to go do is go ahead and click on the plus button to add a stimuli. And we have um, multiple different stimuli. We have images or videos. Um, and those are going to be brought into iMotions. Once again, we're using a resolution of 1920 by 1080. So keep that in mind when you bring in images. If you have an image that's a uh, you know, 100 pixel image, it's going to appear really small on the screen. So if you want your images to be bigger, make them so they fit that 1920 by 1080 resolution. You can also do websites. Um, we support um, Chrome and Firefox and Internet Explorer to do that. Um, there are a few things with websites that we built to help optimize that. If you're doing a traditional website where there is um, just normal scrolling, and there's no floating bars or menu or pop-up ads. It works really well, it's kind of out of the box. Otherwise, we can have a whole other session about how can you optimize the way you set this up so you can use you know, social media where there's a endless scrolling or there's pop-up ads or there's components that don't move. Uh, we have a lot of tools that we built to help look at websites and kind of work around there. Screen recording, this might be something if you have your own application you've built. Um, Sometimes people use something like E-Prime, or they have a little um, app for testing, or Skype or something. You, you can do all of that using a screen recording bucket. So you can think of these as containers to gather information. Uh, face recording basically is just going to record the person's face. It's not going to record anything of what they're looking at. It's just looking at the face, just in case you may be doing interviews or something like that. Uh, scene recording is basically any external video source. That could be maybe a gaming console. If you're going to do anything on mobile devices, like an iPad or something like that, we screen in that data via, or that video feed through uh, a scene recording um, app here. And then we also have um, our survey slide. And you guys are interested in Qualtrics, so let me go ahead and turn that in, turn that on for you guys as well, so that we can do a uh, Qualtrics survey. Um, any questions about what you're seeing here? No, I think we're good. All right, well, let's, let's go ahead and show it. So 
Uh, Taylor, you sent me some of those images, but I'm going to have you kind of build that study there locally. Do you have any of those images on this machine right now? Yes, I do. All right. So why don't you go ahead and click on the images, and let's load those in. Shall we do a static image first? That is easier to uh, do. Yeah, uh, well, actually, you can just grab, uh, let's grab it all and then put it in there when we talk about it. Okay. But just select everything. And we'll go ahead and open it. Okay, so one note, this is a good thing here, is the file names need to be less than 40 characters. Um, iMotion is just because we really um, do a lot of those things, it's going to require you to do that. So if you do have one of your names that are pretty long, you might want to shorten the uh, stimuli. So this just won't work with what we have here. I'll just make a note of that and we can come back and look at the longer character. So you can notice what iMotion does is it goes ahead and brings in each of the images. It does not scale the images. Um, so that's why you're seeing what you're seeing. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so now we have the specific order um, in each of these images. So for each image, if you look down in the center, it's going to give you some information. Um, you can go ahead and click on the preview button to see it if you want. In the center where it says preview, and then click on the word open. In the center console, yeah. So that's going to give you a better look of what's going on there. You can also, um, um, in here, we're not going to do any of the scenes or edits. We won't worry about that. But you can also rename it if you want. Um, it's very important to understand your names because when you're looking at the data, it's going to say all of your eye tracking data is related to this specific image. So, you know, understanding how you design your study and how those images work is going to be very helpful. Now, if you're going to do a website, we probably don't recommend bringing a full image of the website um, that we actually just load it as a website itself. Oh, this is just an um, image of the uh, a mock up page. So, okay. Yeah. And that, that's completely fine. Um, so now we have, we have all these images across here. Um, a few things I want to show you about. Um, one of the things down here where it says exposure. By default, when the images come in, they're set to be expo um, that exposure of six seconds. So if you want to change any of that, that's where you can set it up here. So you have seconds and milliseconds. Um, iMotions can, you know, if you want to show something just for a couple hundred milliseconds, you can change it there as well. So you have that option within iMotions. Um, we'll leave it at six seconds for now. Uh, generally speaking, if you look at like eye tracking behavior, you have two things that drive what people look at. One is called bottom up, so that's looking at contrast. So if you look at your um, Converse shoe one right there, we're going to look at areas where there's contrast between the shoe and the background. Um, your eyes will automatically be drawn to the edges, and also we're automatically drawn to people's eyes and their faces. So that's bottom up. That's physiologically what you look at first just by nature, unless you cognitively are, are trying to override that. Then you have top down, which is what do you want to look at because you're interested in it, because you like it, or because you want to read something. And that's kind of top down. So typically, in the first six seconds, you're going to get a lot of that bottom up feedback, or what are those first things that stand out, what are just drawing your immediate attention. Then afterwards, you see a lot of that cognitive processing, a lot of the other fixations that will move based off of either the image or the context, or even if you tell if you tell them, say, I want you to tell me what kind of clothes people are wearing, they're going to look at it one way versus if you ask them, um, what is this person feeling? So depending on the context, people will cognitively look at an image differently from what they're looking at. Um, so just keep that in mind, and that's why we, we choose that six seconds, because it, it keeps it kind of uh, that bottom up. And if you want longer, you can. Um, the other thing I want to show you is over on the far right, there's a plus button, there's a pencil and a play. Go ahead and click on the pencil button. This is our batch editor. So instead of doing everything one by one, you can come in here and change everything. Um, I do want to point out that the difference between manual advance and fixed position. Um, a fixed position means that um, 
right now everything will be randomized. If you look at some of those images, there's a little shuffle icon in the top left corner of all those images. That's basically saying this is going to randomly play in whatever order. If you always want something to be the very first one, you click on fixed position and then order it either in the batch editor or in the, the timeline up above. So everything right now is you, is you add a, a fixed position, then that image one will always be um, there at the very beginning. All right, so for what we're doing here, I think this looks pretty good. Um, you notice also that we have two videos in there. Um, the exposure for images defaults at six seconds, and then the videos will default at um, their, how long they are in seconds. So we have the moral one, which is 206 seconds, and then the smoky one um, video is 40 seconds long. Um, this also, again, if you want them to manual advance, means that they can skip the video before it's done. That's what the manual advance is. Um, if you turn on the manual advance, it basically means that they'll move when they're ready to move forward. And you have several options to give them, like a space bar, you can set up whatever you want for them to move forward. Um, but generally speaking, that's kind of an overview here. So go ahead and let's close this batch editor out. And we're actually going to have you scroll over just for demoing purposes. Um, let's go ahead and remove a few of these things. So click on the one on the far right. Yeah, let's slide all the way over. And just because we don't want to have you wait, we're actually going to remove the moral one just for now. Um, but whoever has that one, we can look at that later. But let's go ahead and delete that. Yep. Um, and then. Um, Let's go ahead and for now we're going to delete the web page because it's it's going to be a really small one. So go ahead and delete that. Um, and we can leave the text there because this will be good showing them reading behavior. And, and then um, go ahead and choose um, one more of those images just to delete. So we only have a few. Okay. So now we. We brewed eventually built a, a very quick study to show what's going on. Now, typically in a study, you just don't show them images. Um, you might have some instructions or something else to do. So in here, we're going to go ahead and, and click on the plus button on the right, and let's choose a survey slide. So if you're using surveys, um, the way that we look at it is you can pretty much build anything you do in Qualtrics inside of iMotions. Um, Maybe you want to use iMotions if you're going to want a survey that pops up right after an image. Um, it's very difficult to have, unless you want to make one Qualtrics survey for every single image. Um, typically, Qualtrics surveys are used in iMotions for either your uh, initial demographic survey or maybe a post survey at the end. So you just bring it in at one time. That's where Qualtrics works best. Um, we can dive into it if you need it in other places, but generally speaking, that's where that happens. So in here, let's make this like an introduction slide. So if you're, this is kind of like PowerPoint. You have some tools on the left. Um, the top ones, um, they don't require any input, but the ones like that are scales, vertical slides like that, those um, require some input information. Um, also under that, if we can have you, Taylor, click on the um, slide templates. Um, basically, pre-built a, um, a lot of uh, slides and stuff like that. And then they also show you the dimension at which you're, you're using it. So let's go ahead and throw that purchase intent one on. So you can just go ahead and double click on the purchase intent. And basically, um, let's not move any of those around. Leave them. If you can put it back where it was, I'll show you why. So can you move that back down to where it was, the, the text? Yeah. Now, it's kind of hard to see, but that we have a preview button. So if you click on the preview button, you'll notice that some of the things will move. So down at the bottom, where you have all the gray buttons, click on the one preview. It's going to show you what it looks like to respond. So a few things you notice here is there's going to be a question, the options, they can fill it in, you can click on the bullet items, and then when they, they selected it, you can click next and move forward. So this is basically what your respondent will be looking at. Um, so those black lines will kind of move away. Um, now, with this is saying a product, well, we don't know what product it is. So we can go ahead and double click on the image element on the left side. Double click on that. And then let's go ahead and add um, one of the ads there. So let's do that one. We can use that one later. Go ahead and open it. And now you can position this maybe above the question. And if you need to, you can move all the question elements down. Um, also, over on the right, you get some ordering effects, kind of like in PowerPoint. So if you're trying to click on something behind it, you can always click on the image and say send to back. 
um, and you can move things around that way. So this sometimes takes a little bit getting used to of how you kind of navigate around this, but we want to show you that you can um, do some of these options to adjust that. Now the other thing before we preview it, you'll notice it clips off your, your questions. Um, these are kind of uh, cropping boxes, so you'll want to make sure that your questions box is big enough to include everything you want to include. There we go. Just hit preview. Perfect. We have our first question. Um, you can always work better. Um, a couple things when you're building slides and stuff, especially from an eye tracking standpoint, try not to have questions that go across the whole screen. Keep the text in the center. Um, your eye tracking is always better at the center of the screen. Once you start getting over to the edges, um, it, it, it doesn't get as accurate. Also, uh, people are lazy, so if you have um, a, a sentence that goes across the whole screen, it, the, most likely they don't read the whole thing. So having it like this where you have multiple lines kind of centered works out really well. So now we've built this, go ahead and click Save to Study. And we can give this a name. Let's go ahead and name this uh, uh, purchase is 10, and I think you named this image 1. And go ahead and click save. All right, so now we have that. Um, go ahead and move that so it's um, right after the image. So you just click and drag it to your left. All right, so that, that will be following there. You notice that it's shuffled, so you're going to want to click on that and make that a fixed position. So right in the menu, there you go, and then click update. All right, and then we're going to go ahead and add a, another slide. We just want an introduction one. So go ahead and um, click the plus button on the right, and add another uh, survey slide. And this, I think there is actually a slide template for instructions. And if you scroll down there, there's an instruction template, 1920 by 1080. Go ahead and double click on that one. And right now, you don't need to do this, but this will be an example of that. Go ahead and click preview to see if that's how we want it. All right, that looks good. Go ahead and, um, yep, next. And then save that to study. Okay, so now we've built a survey. Now it's kind of up to you. You notice we have black and then white and gray. Um, this is trying to control for maybe the dilation of the pupil. So if you want to keep it consistent, you might make all the backgrounds gray or all of them white or all of them black. Um, you can go in and change that at the survey level if you want. You can also, if you click on the image, you can click on that first image you have there. Um, it says background color, you can change that to another color. Uh, typically the reason why we choose but uh, just to make it consistent, um, you can you can choose those or rotate between what you want. Um, the people will dilate if you have like a really black and white, black and white, that's something that happens there. So I think we're good for now. Go ahead and click on update if you want to get it set. All right, so now we've built a study and we have some a few things randomized. Um, the last thing we're going to do is add a respondent. So on the far right, go ahead and click the plus button uh, by respondents. You can type a name if you want to. If you don't want to do anything like here, you can just go ahead and click Add. You can fill in as much or a little information as you want. So go ahead and click Add for now. All right, now we have a study on the right, or we have a user on the right. We've built our study. Um, the last thing we want to do is um, basically we report it. So before you're doing a reporting, this is where we're going to position everybody correctly. So Taylor, you're going to run yourself through the study. So we want to make sure we have your eye tracking good. You moved your hair out of your way from your face. So that's good. And now that you've checked all that, everything looks good, go ahead and click on the report button. All right, it's going to give you some information saying, all right, you, on your study, you chose to have certain things set up. Global settings meaning the uh, computer is set up for it. We're not using the API now, so that's fine. But it does give you a warning. So once again, if you have an undergraduate, graduate student, or professor who's running this, 
and jumping around, it's going to give you a little warning up front saying, are you sure you want to continue? And if you do, go ahead and click yes. Okay, this is where we're going to have to restart. So go ahead and click OK. I'm going to have to have you um, restart your computer and then come back in and um, it should work. But before we do that, let's just double check your display settings one more time. So right click on your display. And iMotions will automatically save it. So if you close out iMotions, um, as soon as you build it, it's saved. All right, you have to set it 1920 by 1080. Perfect at 100%. All right, so let's go ahead and just um, uh, restart your computer. You're going to have to come back into this link again, and then we can put the data. Okay? okay? This conference is no longer being recorded. And if you would like to take a background break or something like that, yes. I'll be right back, Robert. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry. Happy belated birthday. Oh, thank you. Oh, oh, I'm so sorry. I, I missed knowing, no. and then yesterday I missed telling oh, you. Oh, no, 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 it's fine. I, I wasn't here on, on Wednesday. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But I did get some very nice surprise. So, <laughs> so you did? Yeah. Yeah? Like a birthday gift? Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah. So, like, like, you know, my husband works in Charlotte. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, like, you usually won't come back, like, oh, over, like, oh. the, the middle of the week or something like that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yay. And he came back on Saturday two days, so I was like, okay. Oh, that's, that's so a bonus. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Oh. miss you, Tara, at the Tuesday meeting. I'm sure you didn't miss us. <laughs> I was just thinking about that, wondering what, did we vote for chair? Yes, um, seven for Dr. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, we voted. Um, so yeah. And, uh, who else won? Uh, well, um, so um, Dr. McKeever uh, nominated Dr. Kim, and um, Dr. Grant nominated himself, and then 
uh, there was some discussion, and then um, seven votes for Dr. Kim, one vote uh, proxy for Dr. Kim, which I assume was you, because I think everyone else was, every other voting member was in it, but it was in, um, one for Dr. Graham. And then. Um, Hi, I'm right back. Oh, back. Yeah. All right, we make your presenter here. Okay. Back. All right, let's go ahead and uh, let's check your displays again. Let's see if they, they tell what we want in them to do. Yes. Nancy mm -hmm. Hunt with Kennedy for her yep. mm -hmm. All right, let me uh, turn the recording back on. This conference will now be recorded. Okay, so once again, set your eyes up in the right position. So we'll have you kind of uh, slide back. Okay, and um, everything there looks good. So now let's click on your user again on the right and go ahead and hit record. Do we have everyone? Oh, Shannon, is that for you? Yeah. Okay. okay, yeah. Um, would you mind we we'll just wait for maybe like a minute or so? Yeah. yeah or maybe we fine. can see if um, we have questions, yes, actually, right? I have, I, yeah. I have a ton of questions. So, yeah. since we're going to have different state stations, and also, I know this uh, iMotion software can be installed in like uh, any PC, right? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Can you look closer to the mic? Yeah. yeah, okay. So I was just wondering, because we are sitting here and spend 15 minutes or, you know, 20 minutes setting up the studies, I was wondering if I, you know, since the lab is shared by a lot of other people, so I was wondering if we can set up the study, you know, in our office or at, at home, and then bring sort of like a file to the lab. Is that possible? Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. We uh, we have what we call analysis licenses, and I believe Taylor, you have two of them already. Um, so if you do have like a professor working on it, they can probably check out or install iMotions. In the analysis license, you can do everything except for data collection. So there won't be an option to do the recording, but you can come in um, and and set it up at home, save the study to file, and then load the study in here okay. um, before you before you start recording. Okay. Um, just really super critical when you do that, that when you set up your study, that you know the parameters of the uh, station you'll be on. So that 1920 by 1080 and the screen size. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that, that's possible, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, good, thank you. Mm -hmm. Do we have any other question? Can you show us the, the how you, like, how the research go, going on? you set up everything and yeah. we're going to do it uh, yeah in okay. just the next few seconds so, so we'll yeah. hit record and then i will actually be the participant yeah. looking through every single stimuli mm -hmm. so later on you will see like how the results look like and uh, and everything just yeah. for what what we have done yeah. or um if any of you are interested in looking because i already know all those stimuli so i mean if any of you would be interested in just doing being the participant mm -hmm. I mean, Robert, we can do that, right? It doesn't matter who would be actually. Yep. Yeah. That would be great. So, um, any of you want to be volunteer? <laughs> or? No, I don't know what. I don't know how it's like. Okay. But <laughs> <laughs> so you're the perfect model here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I will just to fake some results. Then. No, just kidding. Um, all right. So I mean, uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, Shannon will join us uh, very soon. Uh, she still have like everything over here. But I mean, because it's already 11:42, so we know that yeah. we scheduled that to end at noon. So how about uh, Robert? We just get started with the with the recording. Let me double check uh, like my face and everything. So, I think I'm ready. And then yeah. really quickly, typically what we ask you to do is, um, can you look at the top left corner of your screen? Mm -hmm. Top right corner of your screen? Mm -hmm. Bottom right corner? Mm -hmm. And bottom left corner? Mm -hmm. 
So when she was doing that, I was looking at the eye tracking box and making sure we didn't lose the eyes. Um, sometimes if they have really long eyelashes or thick frames on their glasses, we'll lose the eyes when we look down. So this one looks terrific, good position, good setup. So now let's go ahead and uh, click record her. Oh, you need to click update. Sorry, I just click update. Oh, okay. and then. Okay. All right, once again, the warning, that's okay. Now, it went forward. It didn't give us the screen resolution one. It's just giving you a feedback saying, um, you probably don't want the responding to read this, but you can turn these warnings off. But as you're starting, these are good to say. Remember, shift space if you want to advance or manual advance one, but everything's set here to normal. Um, and then they, it says make sure they have a keyboard and mouse. So go ahead and click OK. Can we, turn this First, off, um, can we turn this warning off, like somewhere at the setup? Yeah, we can. So before you click OK, um, well, the next thing you're going to happen is you're going to see a dot move across the screen. Yeah. I want you to follow it with your eyes. This is the calibration for the eye tracking. So go ahead and click OK. All right, so you're able to go through the eye tracking. But I think there's an issue, especially when I'm just looking at it, because the camera here, they actually block the central light. So uh, like the, the center dots, upper right, uh, so like it was actually blocking it. So I don't know, like if, um, I don't need to do so click on that. Can we do verify? Click on verify. Yeah. Yep. So you can, so that is the distance that is kind of like, because I can actually look at, I can only look at half part of the dots. Um, so we might, for us, we might actually change like a, maybe um, kind of like a shelter kind of camera or something like that. Um, but yeah. You can also maybe, if you're using like an external monitor, mm -hmm. um, typically set the camera a little higher and that works fine as well. Right. Okay. But so for now, we're just going to go ahead and move forward. So go ahead and click continue. All right, before you click next, um, a few things we want to point out is this is what the respondent's using. Uh, Taylor are viewing, but if, if you have two monitors, you can press F12. Can you go ahead and press F12? Mm, it wasn't, no, we don't really have two monitors. But just go ahead and can you press F12, because it's going to show you. F, no, it, it wasn't popping up anything. Oh, um, press function F12, maybe. Function, function F12, F12. Yeah, function F12. Yeah. No, it's well, using a brightness. Um, oh, it's, it's F8 here. Yeah. Is this what right? Duplicate PC. No, uh, it was it was F12. Well, we will all come back and I'll show that to you guys later. So for now, um, we'll just go through the study and we'll talk about what it is later. So go ahead and you can read this. Yeah. Um, click next when you're ready. So you notice this one doesn't have a next button. Um, this is going to be displayed for six seconds. You have six seconds to read through. Then, So make sure you're, you're taking some good emotions to these. <laughs> oh yeah, I forgot, sorry. <laughs> so is this a video here with all these images? Yes. Okay. All 
right, so we recorded the data. Um, a couple things to point out is just this information here. The red means that um, it's below what we recommend. You notice how each of the, the base one is at 50%. It's because it doesn't, in real time, analyze all the base, and it wasn't because you're missing your base. Um, and then you can also see that the eye tracking one, if it goes below 80%, we flag it for you automatically. So the first one I had, uh, Taylor, I had you looking around other places, so we lost the eyes. But everything else looks really good with um, that. So the first thing you want to do before we do that, let's add the, the data we're missing. So down at the bottom where it says process, affectiva data, click on that button. Close process, yep. And then go ahead and click OK. All right, this might take just a little bit of time. Um, and so this is a good thing to point out that it's a background job. And so this is happening in the background. It's going to give you a percentage for each of these as it's going through and analyzing all the missing facial expression data for you. If you go ahead and close that out, so go ahead and close the button on the far right. Yep. Um, down at the bottom where it says background jobs, and this kind of where it says 90 credits, yeah, 90 credits. Um, the number five, very, very bottom. Which to the right, very bottom of the right. Oh, I, I think it's, yeah. yeah, very edge of the screen. It might be behind something, but you're going to go all the way down where it says uh, study uploaded background jobs in the bottom right corner of the screen. There you go. So over where it says background jobs in white next to the number one. Oh, not there. There we go, right there. So you can pull that up and see where it is. So it's already completed all those. If you click on job queue, oh, there's nothing much. So it's already processed all that. So sometimes there's some background jobs. It's just going to go down there. So I want to point that out. Okay, go ahead and close that. And now you look at all the, the if you go ahead and I think we just did the face data for, for one. Um, so can I ask one more question? I think one of the reasons yeah. for the losing the face data is it because I didn't uh, my face wasn't like uh, center enough or it's not close enough uh, it's too small no no it's it, you're not missing the data it's just the frame so um, let's try another thing go ahead and uh, go to the study right click on the study on the left uh, not the button there press cancel there uh, right click on the study um, yeah, right click and then go down to post processing. Let's do affective again. And then go ahead and click OK. And um, we're not going to stop at these jobs today. We're just going to let them go. Let's see if they kick in here. There we go. So that 50% of that facial uh, data is just showing that we only have like 50% of the data coming in. It's not like we only get a 50% accuracy rate, right? Uh, it's just saying 50% of the data was analyzed. Okay. So let's see if it will do the other ones here for us. All right, so now if we click on the study on the left, you can close this out now. So click on the study on the left, yep. And then um, let's go ahead and uh, click on the username on the right. So now we have that the facial expression is all now around 100% for us. Okay, so basically we got you to the point of where you can set up a study, you can set up the sensors, and uh, run basic a basic study here. We can, we can kind of go around, mess around with this. Um, just, let's just review one of these things. So um, click on the image one. Click on the little play button for that. Um, down in the center area. Sorry. Click on the user on the right. So if we want to look at the user data, so we click on the user in the center. These are all the recordings they have. So click on um, the play button for any of those images. Yep. Yeah. So this is going to do a replay of what was going on. So you see all that same data we saw before. Now down in the bottom to the right, there's a play button. You can go ahead and click that next to the timeline and magnifying glass, click on that. What we're seeing here is how you looked at this image and the information that you looked at. Um, just go ahead and click your mouse over right at that six second mark on the timeline in the bottom. 
Yep. So, that, so all of this here, this is what we're talking about fixations. So what you're seeing here is the size of the fixation, means how long you're looking at it, and then the number in it is the order at which you looked at things. So you kind of see this is what a gaze path on a still image. Um, let's go ahead and exit this. Let's look at what it looks like for a video. Now it's kind of weird because your video is actually a series of still images, but um, now if you go ahead and play it, it's going to look a little bit different. So go ahead and click the play button. You're going to see that it doesn't kind of accumulate over time when it moves. Um, so if this was a movie, it would make it so that you couldn't, um, it would help for a visual movie back and forth. But because these are still images, it might be better for you to have eye motions control how long they're on and push through this information. But you can kind of see here there are some expressions of joy going on at certain different points. And we'll, when um, the engagement was positive and the balance went up, so you can see right about now we should see some type of oh, yeah, smile across her face. And she was talking to. So this is video we are only All right, go ahead and click exit full screen. And then click next to there. So basically what we've shown you really quick is um, to the point where you can collect some data. You can review the data by clicking on the images there. And um, now what I'm recommending you do is kind of build out a study how you like it, maybe keep things a little more consistent, and um, so run three or four people through that. And then next time, we'll go in to say, how do you set up AOIs? How do you, um, what an AOI is, an area of interest. So how do you start making um, uh, quantitative analysis of the qualitative visuals you're getting from the eye tracking? And then also go we'll export the data in the next session. So we've kind of blown through everything. We have about six minutes for any questions you guys might have. No, right. I think we probably now at this moment. I think uh, appreciate the walkthrough. Everything is very clear and and. Uh, the step-by-step -step instruction really appreciate that um, so I think for the next week so the next training would be November the 1st but however this time we do it a little bit an hour early so please mark your calendar it will be 9 30 to 11 instead of 10 30 to noon um, so for that like Robert mentioned that in between uh, um, I'm not planning to submit IRB because this is just for like brilliant data so I'm actually just going to like uh, Fine. Maybe if any of you are volunteering for being the subject, that we can actually play around four to five people for the data. Um, and uh, Robert, is it good? We have a good combination about uh, visual text, uh, video, uh, data. Uh, do you recommend we, we uh, uh, kind of gather the website data as well? Yeah, um, definitely click on some of those, and then you can we can play around and walk you okay. through it. Um, you can try the website one. Definitely videos and still images and these surveys would okay. be really helpful to look at. Um, let me point out two other things really quick before we go. So one thing, once you've collected data, we can't change the study at all. So if you right click on the study on the left, um, where the study where it says test one, yep, right click on that. Uh, one thing is somebody asked about how do you design a study and bring it, it's saved to file. If you click on that, that will save it to a file. Um, it will create a zip file and then you just bring that in and load it into iMotion. Um, the other thing I want to point out is uh, you can clone the study. Um, we're not going to save it right now, so just go ahead and click cancel. But basically, find a location and you can do that. But if you right click on it and clone the study, it will duplicate it, but it will remove um, any of the other respondents in it. So go ahead and we call this copy. Yep. Now we'll call how you had in all the previous settings, and that will load. Yep, so now it's a copy. Uh, the thing I want to point out here is um, let's go ahead, go click on the test one. Click on in the, in the center there, it says stimuli blocks enable. I'll go back into test one copy, anywhere before. And now in the center there, where it says all the information about the study, there's a thing right above where I think where your mouse is. It says uh, description and then stimuli blocks enabled. Go ahead and click on that. And then click update. Down at the bottom. Yep. All right, so basically most people um, have different groups and controls or they want to 
let's say you're looking at smoking and vaping, or you're looking at ads that were happy and ads that were maybe um, trying to be more uh, depressing or something like that. Maybe you want to have those all grouped together. You don't want to intermix them. So you have these blocks, right? And you want the blocks to stay together, but in those blocks, you want to be randomized. So this is a really powerful tool, especially for people in the communication field, is designing some blocks. So now let's go and click on that batch editor again on the far right, the little white pencil. And in here now we have these sections under the bottom where it says blocks and run stimuli. Um, down in the bottom left, we're going to have you click on the plus button to make a block. Okay, and in here we can make blocks. So let's go ahead and move the image and the image content. Yep, and that's going to be our block one. Go over to the top left and let's label it uh, shoes or something. So the block name in the top left. So we'll call that one shoes. And we want those fixed positions, so they're always going to be in the same order. Go ahead and click save. Now let's add a new block and let's put the text in the block. So the, the, the two ones, I'll grab those two and move those over. And we'll call this one uh, text, yep. And go ahead and click save. All right, and then let's go ahead and put the, the, all the smoking stuff together as well. And the video, yeah. All right, and then that uh, happy, was there one more in there? What's that? Oh, that's what the one on my phone. Okay. And that's the random one, so we don't need a block for that one because there's no, there's no need for it. It's just one by itself. So now that we have those blocks, let's build the study that we want people to look at. So down there you have those folders. Let's move all three of those folders over to the right. And you notice when you do that, it's going to take all the images that are in those folders and move them in automatically. And then let's grab the instructions and put them in there as well. And let's grab the happy or the last one you have there and move that in as well. Okay. And let's make the instructions fixed position, but now let's click on it and move it to the top. So click on that and then the arrows move that up to the top. And let's keep the, the happy face one at the or for, yeah, go ahead and click on that one. Make that one fixed position too. And we'll leave that one um, just right after instruction. So go ahead and, and do fixed position on that one. So this one? Yeah, we'll just click on the checkbox to the right of it. It says fixed position. There you go. And before you click save, over on the left, let's name this as uh, study uh, path one. So over in the name, call it study path one. Yeah, right there, block name. And then underneath it says use block as a runnable slideshow. Go ahead and check on that. All right, and then go ahead and click on save. And we're just gonna make really quickly another one that's just smoking. So do the introduction. And then let's grab just the smoking one. Yeah, and smoking images. Oh, no, um, remove those images. Sorry, remove the images. The folder. Yeah, just add the folder there. Yep. And then fixed position, the top one, instruction. And we'll call this one um, study path two. And click on usable, perfect. So go ahead and click save. And so now we close out this, this interface. So check it at the top. There we go. So now you notice over on the left, we have the, the different blocks we created. And if you want to edit those, you can click on any of those on the left and, and then click on the pencil and you can edit those. On the right, we see that we have the runnable slideshows. These are ones that you can actually record data with. Um, and then all on, down in the bottom, there's a plus, a pencil, and a little picture one. Click on the picture one. And when that opens up, it's going to show you basically what the study is going to look like. So you can now click shuffle. And if you click shuffle on the bottom left, you can see how those will switch and randomize those different blocks because if those were randomized. And you can see how we did the one with the shoes. The first image is always first in there. But if you look at the smoking one, inside of that block, it's actually randomized. So sometimes we'll have the baby first, sometimes we'll have the other one first. So this shows you how you can build pretty complex study designs. Um, with that. So the last thing I want to show you, and then we're right at time, go ahead and close this out and then close out the batch editor at the top right. And then let's add a respondent. Uh, under the test copy, right? Yep. Yep. 
Go ahead and click add to user team, okay? Now, um, we're not going to run the whole thing, but go ahead and click on report. When you click on report, it's going to say, these are the runnable slideshows. Which one do you want to run? So let's say you you had you wanted everybody to have the same instruction. Maybe you had everybody want to see the text, but you wanted some people to see happy smoking pictures and other ones to do negative one. You could build a single study in iMotions, but run it as if it was two different studies here. So that way you can combine data of similar things. So you can say, all right, is everybody looking at the prompt? Is everybody looking at the instructions? And then everybody would have their unique data for the different paths. All right, so we went through a lot of extra stuff. This was kind of an added feature we typically don't cover, but I found that a lot of people in communications um, really likes this. So what I'll do is I'll follow up, I'll send um, information about the facial expression that was asked for. I'm also going to send um, instructions of how to use and install a Qualtrics survey. And then, um, and also send instructions of how to run a website if you want to. Yeah, that would be so great. I'll send those. I'll send those three things, and then between now and November first, um, you can run at least one study with four or five people. And if you want to run another study with just um, website, you can run that on one or two people too. Okay. Sounds good. Let's see if we have any final questions before we uh, so finish. The thing of this conference call will be given to you and you will distribute to us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, the links, I think I will share that with Brooke and then she will share with, yeah, all the people. Yes. Yeah. So to access some of the links I'm sharing, I'll need everybody's name and email so they can get access to the help center. Okay, okay, good. So we can do a sign up on, in whatever way. Yeah, perfect. Okay, well, wonderful. We, we blew through a lot of stuff. It's really quick. Best way to learn it now is just put your hands on it and try to design it and test it, and you'll, it'll start kind of solidifying after a while. Sounds good. So thank you so much for your time. Yeah, um, we'll definitely see you in a week. Sounds good. Yeah. All right, take care. Bye. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Bye. I hope that's helpful. I uh, hope that it's 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 a, it's a lot. Yeah. Um. So I guess we yeah appreciate all your time here. So um. Yeah, we we'll definitely do this again. Uh, like we mentioned, that we we'll send out the link. Uh, and we were expecting more people coming for the next uh um the next week session. Um. um so I yes. think, I think for everyone to get the link, then you need to have the name and the email. Right. Oh, for so I'm talking. Yeah, so we can do this for uh, because he's going to register every single of you with an account with your email, so that you have an account to access uh, all the tax documents through the help center. Um, at, at iMotion. So uh, thanks, Jennifer, for doing that already. So we can just pass around this, and I can just uh, copy all of you in the emails and then send them to him. Yeah. So uh, Lin Wan's question earlier was something about being able to do everything but collecting the data on yes. a remote computer, and he said something about these, I forget the term you use, some, some sort of licenses? Yes. yes. So how would any person in this room or beyond be able to then do that? Like, would you have to get a license on each person's computer? Um, and I, no, I think we only have, like what Robert mentioned, I need to confirm, we only have two license now, So, but we only have one, this particular laptop, which was got it yesterday, who, that can actually run like the, the study. So I assume that for that, if we have two, so for example, that like uh, uh, Shannon's using one, and then she could use that one and then save it as a zip file, and then bring it to the lab to do data collection. Yeah. Okay. But then we only have but, two li licenses. Yeah, yeah. So, so we cannot get every single license for. No. So what you're no. saying? So you're saying like I want to build this at home. Yeah. Um. So, so you then, still need a license to build it at home. You need, yeah. you need a license. And there are only that. two. Yes. Yeah. There are only or two. you can check yeah. the laptop out, right? But can you analyze the files on a different computer or only that computer? The um. The you license. need a license to analyze right. that so you as have well. To have these yeah. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, I'm, just, I'm just worried about yes. because like, think about we have, we have the lab right. and then all the lab computers that have the license can click their, you know, collect their data and everything. Right. But right. then Same. you don't want to spend a lot of time in the lab, you really? know, the, the, the right. study. But we can check you can out check it out and bring it home. Yeah, yeah. but you only have two licenses. So yeah. there, there's no way we can increase the number of licenses? No, I think that's... That's excessive. Okay. I think the, okay, so uh, here we go. The license means every single thing. 
So the license means every single thing built in, like EEG, eye tracking. So, okay. so those are yeah, those uh, so are what because they're It's a software stuff. It's like a Cortex. We have the license that everyone can mm. use Cortex on their own. Yeah. Then I can. The license will be expensive. Okay. Yeah. But I think okay. it would be easy enough if we had a sign out sheet for these. Like, yeah. if I am doing the analysis oh, yeah. of my data at home, I can take one home and then Lin Wan can sure. have the other one to use. We'll have a lab for running a yeah. study. Yeah. Exactly. It okay. should work. Like an me. online system where you can look at okay. future yeah. lab schedule, yeah. like yeah. who is doing the analysis at this moment that will block that. Yeah, yeah I think exactly. yes. it works well at Syracuse because yeah. you just know who's got it for a certain week and then yeah. you plan the following week sure. to do your right. analysis. Yes. And it's yes. not that bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it won't be. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Cool. Yes. Yeah. Sure. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Do we have everyone's email? Um, 